Hello and welcome to this video about rectangular waveguides. In this video we'll be deriving equations to describe the propagation of electromagnetic waves in a waveguide. To do this properly Maxwell's equations will be used directly and a lot of vector calculus will be used as well. So I'll try to present it fairly gently and guide you through the derivation so as to get used to using this sort of math. So this is what a rectangular waveguide looks like. It is a hollow tube whose cross section is in the shape of a rectangle. By convention A will be greater than B. A will be along the x-axis and B will be along the y-axis. And there will be no loss of generality when this is done. The waveguide will be made of a good conductor, usually a metal. The rectangular waveguide is the easiest of the waveguides to solve using theory. Here is a list of all of its advantages and disadvantages, so as to help you decide whether to use them or not. The advantages are that they are lossless, and the signal is shielded from noise from outside the waveguide, and it can handle high power radiation. The disadvantages are that they are bulky and heavy, and can only carry a small range of frequencies. They are dispersive, so they'll distort a signal if it has more than one frequency in it, and it is mathematically hard to work with. So here's a sketch or short summary of how we'll derive all of the equations for the rectangular waveguide. Firstly, we'll modify Maxwell's equations so we can work with them more easily. We'll then solve these equations for a region that's inside the waveguide, which should approximately equal that for a wave in free space. We can then find the solutions for these waves in the direction of the axis of the waveguide, or the Z direction, for special cases called the TE and TM modes, which we'll soon find out about. Then we can use some algebra to find various quantities. One of these is called the cutoff frequency. We can then find all of the fields in the waveguide in all directions. Lastly, we can practice using simple algebra equations to solve different problems for these waveguides. So these are the Maxwell's equations that we'll be using. They are all expressed in terms of vector calculus, which you'd need to understand if you watch this video. We'll simplify these equations using the following known facts. Firstly, that there is no accumulated charge in the waveguide anywhere, so this variable, which is the charge density, is set to zero. Then there is no external current driving this system, so the current density is set to zero too. In this waveguide, we are using electromagnetic waves of only one frequency, expressed as the radial frequency omega. So the time derivative is equal to this complex number. This will greatly simplify all of the derivations right from the beginning. In most textbooks and online videos, the H field is used in preference to the magnetic field B. So I decided to use it in my video to avoid confusion. This is how H is related to B. And in free space and for high frequencies, mu is set equal to the permeability of free space. So these are the Maxwell's equations that we'll be using in this video, which have been simplified using these known smaller equations. I'll just write them out again here in the corner so that we can watch them during this first derivation where we'll derive the wave equation for the electromagnetic field inside the waveguide. We'll take the curl of equation 2. And the first thing we can do is factorise these constants outside of the curl. Then we'll calculate the left-hand side of this equation. 
This is what taking the curl twice is equal to. So we know that div E is 0, and we can substitute this in. Then the gradient of 0 is also 0, and so we're left with the Laplacian of E. Now we'll work on the right-hand side of this equation. We can substitute one of Maxwell's equations into it, which gives us this equation. Multiplying everything together gives us this. So now we have this equation, which already looks like a wave equation. We can manipulate it into this form, which gives us the wave equation in a more standard form. Now we'll write it out again up the top, so we can look at it while we do the rest of the derivation. We can already express this wave equation in terms of the wave number k, which is proportional to the inverse of the wavelength. We can expand this vector calculus equation out into a partial differential equation. And so this is what the expansion looks like, so you can see how vector calculus helps to keep equations compact. We can decouple this equation, seeing that each expression that is multiplied by a different unit vector, like i hat and j hat, can be separated. So this is what the decoupled equations look like, one for each direction, x, y and z. z represents the forward direction of the wave through the waveguide, and can be solved to be the exponential of z multiplied by a special propagation constant called gamma, which is either complex or positive real and never negative, because then the coefficient of z would be positive, and a wave can't increase its strength unless it is driven by an active power supply. So this is what gamma looks like as a complex number. Alpha is the attenuation, and is positive, and beta is the phase constant. Alpha and beta can't both be non-zero at the same time which we'll find out later. The wave is more restricted in the x and y directions, being standing waves, and will be found to be equal to these expressions, which we'll see when we derive them for the TM mode. And we can similarly get these equations for H, the magnetic field. These are the equations for the TE mode. We'll continue these calculations in part two.